All right, tonight's scripture comes from John chapter 5, 1 through 9. Sometime later, Jesus went up to, the, up to Jerusalem for a feast of the Jews. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and, le and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I am trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured picked up his mat and walked. This is the word of God for the people of God. So I guess that means that it's my turn to talk. Quick intro for those of you that don't know me. My name is Evan Wadsworth, and I've been on this campus for four years now. I'm one of those seniors that was spoken of earlier. So this is my final chapel service, my final finals week next week, and a whole lot of other finals things coming up in the next few days. So um, I'm very honored to be able to speak to all of you on this last of chapels for the year. Um, and I hope that you can get some things out of the message just as I did. Um, a little bit more about me. Chemistry and biology, double major. Um, and I have been accepted to graduate school, so I'll be going on to more school. It's not like I'm finished with everything. So we'll see where that journey takes me. But I thought to get us started, we could talk about uh, a little bit about just America's concept of the way that we act. You know, We've got this incredible idea that the only benefit that we can get out of things is if there is an immediate benefit. That we have such a drawing towards these now relationships, as I'm calling them. We want to come to school and get an education and start make, making money right now. I'm not one of those people. I'm continuing doing school and things, but a lot of people choose that path to come to school for four years and start doing things now. We buy phones and things so that we can be entertained right now, that we can be connected to the world right now. But I want to suppose that. Uh, the relationship with Jesus is more like a retirement fund. So a lot of you might think that I don't have any idea what a retirement fund is. I don't know where you're going with this. Don't worry, I'm right there too. I don't necessarily know what one is. Uh, but it is definitely something that is talked a lot about in today's day and age. Uh, we all have a future that we're hoping to plan for. We want to be able to do some things when we're finished working, hopefully. And so we need to set, up, set ourselves up for that opportunity. But the question always rises, which is how much should I invest right now in such a retirement fund that's going to be there way later on in my life? And what should I do right now to make sure that I can get the most out of um, life later on? Like I said, retirement funds definitely help us set up a better future. So there's that idea that the more one invests right now, the more that one can get out of the retirement fund later on. And so this is very much like the relationship with Jesus. Uh, Jesus is just kind of waiting there for people to invest in him so that we can retire with him one day. I personally have fallen into the temptation many times of kind of using Jesus as a crutch for my immediate needs um, rather than a retirement fund, kind of those real fast stocks that can go up and I can get a lot of good benefit out of him. Um, when I need to, but then when things are going well, then I don't really have to, to worry about it. So um, I hope that, as the text will show, I, along with probably most of you, have had some kind of uh, misplaced expectations and have limited Jesus and his role in my life. And I hope that we can kind of work through that together tonight. Um, so as it was read earlier, John chapter 5, I'm just going to kind of go through uh, some more of the verses and break it down a little bit more so that we can get the most out of the text as possible. So verses 1 and 2 says, After this there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. 
Now there is in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roof colonnades. So first off, I just want to make the point that Jesus kind of has an incredible like, dream job of anyone that wants to travel. He has the ability to literally go wherever he wants and talk and spread his word and his message and things. Now, of course, there is a plan to all of the, the wandering around and the traveling from city to city. Uh, so it's not necessarily that he can do whatever he wants, but he gets to go all over the place. And I think that that is just a, an awesome career path to find himself in. But I want to point out real fast, um, in verse 2, there's mention of this sheep gate um, at the, the Temple Mount where this big uh, festival was happening. Um, I don't think that it's a coincidence that the sheep gate is talked about here because it's not necessarily hugely important to the story. Um, it's important that he's in the temple, but the sheep gate is kind of close to the pool and things like that. But I think it's really cool that the author brings that out right here because um, way back in the Old Testament, in the story of Nehemiah, which I have not really read very much, but <laughs> it is in there. And if you want to read about building and things like that, that's a good place to start. So they are rebuilding this big temple after some devastation had occurred. And the very first gate that they built uh, was this sheep gate. And that's where um, some of the herders could bring in their sheep to be sacrificed for the offering that all of the, um, the Jews had to give at the time. And so um, there were other gates around the area, such as the fish gate, the gate of the guard, and the, the inspection gate, as it was called. So I think that it's very important that it's called the Sheep Gate um, right now, as it is definitely an indication of the time to come. Uh, when Jesus is the Lamb of God, he's there to sacrifice um, for us. And it's kind of ironic how a lot of the people at the time had absolutely no idea that this was the plan. They had expectations that Jesus was uh, this big guy that was going to come in and kind of wipe out all of the people that were afflicting the Jews. Uh, but it was definitely not that. Uh, not so. Um, and so, moving on, the pool that was talked about is kind of known for its healing powers. I'm going to discuss that in just a little bit. But moving on in the scripture, uh, verses 3 through 5. And these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. So, whenever you are someone that is paralyzed or diseased or afflicted in some way, it is above and beyond worse than it is today. Back then, there was no healthcare system. There is no uh, service to take you places that you need to go. There's no service to necessarily bring you the food that you need or the water, the clothing, all of those um, types of things are fairly small. Um, in their, their ministries at the time. So somebody that is paralyzed or kind of left in one spot is there for a long time. 38 years for this guy, in fact. How long is 38 years, you may ask? Well, I've got an answer. It's longer than I've been alive, that's for sure. And longer than most of you have been alive as well. In fact, 38 years ago, my parents were in middle school they didn't even know probably what the marriage thing was going to be like, and they had no idea that they were going to have three kids, but I think them for that. Every single day. <laughs> uh, 38 years ago also, Steve Wozniak designed the Apple One, which through a lot of trials and errors and things like that, we now have iPhones keep us connected to the world to, to be cool, the cool kids on the block, to make sure that we show up to class on time, as my alarm clock every single morning. Also, 38 years ago, we wouldn't be coming to the University of Indianapolis. Back then, it was called Indiana Central College. So I still get that. If I go around in the community sometimes to some of the uh, older people, they still call it uh, Indiana Central College. They have no idea what the University of Indianapolis is about. But it's a whole different story. <laughs> so uh, moving on in the text, verses 6 and 7. It says that when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had been there already for a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? Seems like a pretty simple question. So the sick man answered him, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. 
and while I am going down, uh, another steps down before me. So you may ask, why is this pool like so special right now? And that comes from kind of uh, a, a verse that's left out in my translation, but other translations um, include it, and it says that um, kind of an angel came down when the season was right and would kind of stir the waters, and so the very first person that got into the water was healed of whatever the disease that they had. So this place was a very well-known area that a lot of invalids had come to to seek some sort of healing. Uh, but Jesus, early on in verse 6, he puts his kind of divine knowledge out to show um, and like just realizes that the guy has been there for a very, very long time. And he asks him a simple question. As he does in a lot of his teaching, he kind of uses the most simple way to allow us to, to figure out what is actually going on, what we actually want, what we think that we need, what's at the root of what we're asking and things. And so the man answers with his own ability and with the, the, the ability of the people around him to try to get him down to the pool whenever the waters are stirred, whenever that may be. So this guy has been kind of out on his own, been working on this for 38 years and has gotten uh, no results. Verse 8 says that Jesus said to him, Get up, take up your bed, and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. So Jesus was the only one uh, who could give him what he so clearly wanted. He was uh, an invalid who was just kind of there for 38 years of his life. Um, and the man did as he was, as he was instructed and received the healing. So, why have I gone through this story right here? What is the point, you may ask? The first one is that Jesus calls our needs to mind. Sometimes in ways that we don't necessarily want him to. Uh, very clearly in verse 6, Jesus kind of asks the man a very simple question, just so that the man verbalizes and gets out there really what he wants. Sometimes I figure out what I want most by praying for some sort of answer. However, Jesus doesn't necessarily give me the answer, it doesn't give me the good test score that I need, but instead goes on to point out some big flaw that I've been kind of passing over uh, for some time. So Jesus does a really good job of calling our needs to mind uh, whether we like it or not. So Jesus' question allowed the man to see where he fell short, that he couldn't get into the water, and that Jesus had an answer to that. So moving on, Jesus heals as only he can do. The man was looking for help from earthly measures, from himself, from others, from his friends, uh, from anyone that would come by and give him the time of day. But his method hadn't worked for 38 years. He's still there after 38 years of trying the same thing. And so Jesus steps in to heal. However, you may be thinking, what about the multitude? So there's this big pool, and there are all of these people around here that are invalid. And one guy gets the special gift of healing. He was an extreme case, of course, so he was probably well known by the people that this guy had lived longer than most people in his time, and he had been invul an invalid for the entirety of his life. So why were more not healed? Jesus could have easily dipped his finger into the pool and healed everybody at once. What a miraculous sign that would have been. People could have been raving about this for years and years on, um, and the story of Jesus could have been catapulted uh, across the nation. But Jesus kind of just wandered off after the healing. He disappeared into the crowd. He had another conversation um, with the gentleman, which I encourage you to read in the next part of the chapter. Um, but he really didn't give the time of day to the other people. So that brings me to the, the question of why did Jesus come? Not why did Jesus come to this specific location, to the Temple Mount on this day, to enjoy the feast, to heal this guy. But why did Jesus come in the first place? And so I was thinking about this question earlier, and I was trying to get myself to narrow it down just to, just to one thing. Not using and, and Jesus did this, and this, and this, because that is very true. 
But Jesus came not to heal us of our physical brokenness, but he came us to heal, heal us of our spiritual brokenness and to give us eternal life that we couldn't get from other sources. Other people could have been able to heal this guy at the time, probably not very well, but Jesus was the only one that could do what was really needed at the time. So what sort of results <clears throat> have you expected out of your relationship with Jesus? Were you one of those people that was an invalid that saw this big miraculous sign happen to somebody and you were mad about it? Were you somebody that was there and you, you celebrated his just recovery from what had been 38 years of lying there and asking and begging for forgiveness and for mercy of other people? I'm sure that most of you are pretty familiar with some of the passages um, in Matthew and later on in John. I'm going to read one um, real fast, but um, John 14, 13 and 14 says that whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. So this is very much kind of a, an American verse that we like to hear, that we like to say, Oh, I believe in Jesus because I'll ask him anything and he will be able to give it to me. I am safe in my salvation because I asked Jesus and he's willing to give it to me. And that may be true. But there are certain qualifiers to these verses. There's another one in Matthew talking about asking, uh, you shall receive. There are certain qualifiers for these passages that it's really easy to kind of gloss over. And so in verse 13, it talks about how whatever you ask in my name, uh, in my name is an indication of things that Jesus kind of already does. Um, you're going to ask of something that he's really good at doing in his name. And the second one is that the Father may be glorified. Passing your finals next week may not be a way that the Father can be glorified. It could be. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that you shouldn't or can't pray that. But if it doesn't happen, just know that that was probably not the way that the Father uh, was to be glorified. So I just wanted to call to our attention that when we are asking uh, for things and we expect these certain results, we expect everything to be better after praying, it's definitely important to realize that God has a plan and that he will give us whatever is in, in accordance with that plan, not just whatever we want to see happen. So this brings us to a time of reflection. Now for this, I would like us to, to separate into groups of you know, two or three or four, if you absolutely have to, uh, preferably with people that are close by, but people that you may or may not know. And we've got a couple of questions that I believe are in the bulletins in front of you, if you would like to peruse those. But I'm going to go ahead and read them for you. Uh, but I would like for you to share some answers with each other, share some experiences, Share some real life scenarios where you would like to make improvements in these areas. And the first question is, in what ways have you had misplaced expectations in your walk with Jesus? And the second one is that, what steps can you take during the summer to change your outlook? You've got an entire summer. A lot of times there are messages that it's, you're supposed to try to do something and it's going to work in the, the very next week. We've got a whole summer to put together this list of things that you're going to come up with right now to see if, to be able to change your relationship uh, with Jesus. But I'm going to pray for us first, and then we can get on with that. Dear God, just thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak tonight at chapel. Thank you for giving me the passage that you laid on my heart to share 
uh, with all these great people out here. Uh, I just thank you for the ministry of the chapel this year. Thank you for uh, all the people that have worked diligently to make this happen every single week. Just now I pray that you will be with uh, all of these, these students as we evaluate our walk with you, as we really call into question why we're doing some of the things that we're doing, what we truly want to get out of the relationship. I pray that you will uh, place these things on all of these students' hearts, that your will may be done here tonight. And in your name I pray. Amen. So go ahead and break up since you're going to do two or three or four and talk about it for just three minutes. Oh. Uh, Hi. Have you met Bobby? I'm Bobby. Hi. 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 Hi